Hello and blessed Tuesday of the third week of Advent 2023. Is, is Advent super short? I guess it's super short this year because the fourth Sunday is on is next Sunday and then Christmas is the next day. So I personally love Advent, as I'm sure I've said about 80 times, but um, that's okay. We'll make the most of it. Um, Anyway, today I've just returned from Mass and uh, just thinking so much about how all of the greatest story ever told is based on children, on a child, a child, new birth, new life coming into the world. Um, the, the star rises in the east over the Holy Family, Mother, Father Joseph, Mother Mary, baby. And um, that it's so um, emblematic of the fact that existentially, metaphysically, physically, biologically, emo every single way the human person is geared, is made to bring new life into the world, foster new life. It's just so beautiful. And, uh, and, and that the Gospel of Luke begins with two births announcement of two births, both by the angel Gabriel, and they're both like impossible. Uh, with God, everything is possible. They're both kind of impossible. Um, today we have uh, the first the first annunciation by Gabriel to Zechariah. And if you know the story, Zechariah is old. His wife Elizabeth is old, supposedly barren. They've longed for a kid, but they're too old to have kids. And um, Zechariah is in the temple burning the incense, and he's all by himself. And the angel Gabriel it says, uh, comes and says, announces, "Oh, your wife is going to bear a son, and uh, he's going to be a great, a great man. He's going to be called John. Uh, many will rejoice at his birth. He will be great before the Lord. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb." And um, so this is a huge deal. But how? But what? And uh, and uh, next, when she's when Elizabeth is six months um, pregnant, the angel Gabriel then comes to Mary and makes an even greater announcement, um, or, or issues, I should say, an even greater invitation, because these women are not forced to bear a child into their wombs. There, it's really Gabriel comes as a as a uh, right to ask uh, whether they would accept this honor. And um, interestingly, both and they're, and they're both impossible. Elizabeth is too old, and Mary has not had relations with a man. So how how can this be? And um, and they both both Zechariah and Mary ask a question. Interestingly, Zechariah gets chastised for his question. Mary, by contrast, gets crowned queen of heaven and earth eventually. So what's the difference? And um, so I really studied this this morning. Uh, and Zechariah says, um, you know, after after the angel says, yeah, your son is going to prepare a way for the Lord and uh, make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? for I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. So that's his question. And the angel st strikes him mute. He doesn't get to talk for a while. I don't think he opens his mouth till he, the kid is born and he says his name is John, um, which Zechariah has been instructed by the angel. But anyway, um, and I think Zechariah's question is goes toward He's to me, he's kind of saying like, oh, that sounds kind of cool, but um, how shall I know this? Because I'm old, my wife is old, we're going to die pretty soon. We're not going to know whether your prophecy that the, the we're not going to see the fruit of or the proof of what you're telling me. And so I think that's why he gets chastised. He's not trusting fully. He's more focused on um, uh, you know, are we going to be honored for this or are we going to really see how great this news is? Whereas Mary, when the angel Gabriel makes his announcement, says, you can see her just pondering. And Mary, as we know, all through the Gospels, barely speaks. She says, do, do what he tells you in the wedding at Cana. She says, 
my soul magnifies the Lord. Um, she's always points to Jesus rather than herself. But she says, how can this be? For I have no relations with a man. And to me, she's, she's not saying, well, I won't live long enough to see whether he sits in the throne of David forever. But it's more like, what? are you kidding me? Like God, God is that great that he could, I could have a child without having had relations with a man. Um, if it's so, I'm all in. That's how I, that's how I read it. So maybe that's why the angel, she, she doesn't get, um, and of course, she doesn't get chastised in the angel and God and all of the cosmos, of course, sees into her heart, um, or the cosmic God, whatever, however you want to put it, God, the father of the universe and of all creation, sees into her heart and sees, oh, she's ready. She's going to say yes. And she says, behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Anyway, it's, um, so that's kind of interesting, just, just to the point of how any kind of like close study of the scriptures or just sitting with them yields all kinds of um just you know raise a lot of questions and we get insights that are interesting but to me the two stories together that this is one of the four gospels it begins with these two stories they're both births and and the mothers figure prominently in them too it's not like it's not just oh these two great men are going to both of these women are also deeply deeply honored within the church um i mean mary come on but but that they're they're impossible for man both of them to me speak to this deep one of the most beautiful things about incarnate the inc incarnation about catholic teaching the, the story is that we're all invited to the table. It's the only institution, um, if that's the word, on earth whereby if you're an old, aging, single, childless, spouseless um, person, such as myself, I have a place at the table right along with the mother of 12 or w with anyone. I mean, high, low, in between, sick, well, healthy, rich, poor, that we're all, if our hearts are oriented to this exaltation at new life, at our, at our, um, the understanding that our job is to bring new life into the world, however that may be given to us. Um, obviously, if you're past childbearing age, that's not possible. If you're not married, it's not possible. I mean, you know, sacramentally kind of, um, but yeah, no matter our orientation, any of it, uh, you know, we may be ill suited by temperament. Some of us can't, um, we may not be able to um, attract a member of the opposite, so, you know, a, a mate, a spouse with whom we're gonna have to, but it, does, it none of that, it's like, oh, you think you're too old? No, 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 here's your place at the table. Oh, you think you've been excluded by virtue of this, disorder whatever the disorder may be no 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 you have a place oh no no come to the table order your life offer up your sexuality your procreative powers your heart everything that you have to bring new life into the world again in whatever way you have maybe it's creatively um, maybe it's biologically but if you can't do it biologically then our job becomes part of it to support of course new life and the openness to new life in the people who can bear new life into the world. So uh, this just gives me great, great hope. And so it makes my life one where, uh, and I, you know, I've talked about this before and I'm sure will again, you know, this conscious embrace of the celibacy I'm called to as a single uh, person in the church has led to such such a flowering and such a deep sense that I too am in on new birth, in new life, and rejoice at it. Um, although, you know, kids often drive me crazy. But, <laughs> but I mean, you know, theoretically, you know what I mean. Of course, my heart exalts at it. and um, 
uh, and, and it gives, it gives, you know, when you're invited to the human table, you have a place out of it. It gives you a per, your life a purpose and a meaning. And it is so not based on a demand to be specially recognized for either, either my sort of disorders and defects and wounds or my talents and gifts. Like we don't, it's like, that's implicit in the invitation of the church. Of course you're invited, whoever, however you are, but it's not, this isn't, we don't like single people out to, um, you know, congratulate. It's like, if you wanna be part of the thing, like go to confession, confess, you know, examine your conscience and like come and give what you have. You don't, you don't make demand. It's like the church already gives us the body and blood of Christ. I mean, there is no greater gift. It's already been given, you know? So what the point is, what can I offer in return? So that, and on that note, I watched, here's a movie recommendation. I watched this movie last night. It had it on my list for a while. Um, it's called Lock, L-A-C-L-O-C-K-E, 2013, um, written and directed by Stephen Knight, um, British guy, I think, and um, Tom Hardy, who I, of course, since I only basically watch movies from the 40s and 50s, had no idea who he even was. Apparently, he's quite well known and has been in a bunch of kind of blockbuster, um, you know, I don't know, movies I haven't seen. But anyway, um, and it's all about the stuff I've been talking about, it's all about the family, the responsibilities of parenthood, our procreative powers and where they can lead us both astray and of course toward, toward the light. Um, but anyway, he plays, it, it takes place entirely within a car. Um, a BMW, something or rather X5 or X3 or something like that. I, I wouldn't know, but um, and the so Ivan Locke, the protagonist, is a um, uh, well-paid, very uh, devoted family man and very, very well respected in his field. And his field is concrete. He's um, in charge of this massive project. It's the biggest project that's going up the next morning. He sets out at night in his. BMW after work and this project is to is to be started the next morning. It requires road closures and hundreds of trucks coming in and coordinating it all. But he, Ivan, has and he has two sons and a, and a wife. They're all waiting for him at home. They're going to watch this um, this uh, kind of pivotal football game or um, or rugby or whatever whatever they watch. <laughs> <laughs> my 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 uh, my mind glazes over, but you know it's a huge match. They're they're big fans. You've got two sons you gather there. It's kind of you know maybe ten and thirteen or something like that. And um, so anyway, he sets off, and it turns out that he has had a one night stand. The only time he's ever been unfaithful in his marriage. He was away from home for three months and you know, there was wine and a big project got finished and he ends up with this woman who's older and her, he keeps saying, she's old, she's old. I think she's 42 or something like that. But um, so they sleep together. She's very fragile. And of course she gets pregnant. So, um, and that was it. He had one night stand, went home. He hasn't told his wife up to this night. And she, the woman, Bethan is her name, who's pregnant. The mother is in the hospital. She's giving birth. The baby, it, the, her waters broke two months prematurely. And so Ivan Locke has made this decision, obviously this deep, deep decision of conscience that he must be at the hospital when the mother gives birth to his son. And he, and he keeps, he has a deep sense of responsibility. He keeps saying, it's my fault. It was my fault. He uses the word fault, which you kind of want to say, like, a new baby isn't a fault. You know, it's it's a responsibility. But, um, but anyway, so en route, 
he's in the car the whole time. It's dark. The cars are whizzing by and trucks and there's lights and stuff. But um, he's his phone. He's on the phone in his car constantly and calls come in and come in. And um, one of them is from his kind of um, minion or understudy, Donald, who's obviously this kind of, um, you know, eager but kind of callow youth. And um, and I, Locke is, is determined to coordinate this huge project from his car and to get this guy. This guy has to do his bidding. And so he's really inviting the kid to manhood during the whole night. You know, he's basically saying, listen, this is going to be really hard. You're going to have to stay up all night. Here's the calls you have to make. I'm going to give you these instructions. You must follow them to the letter. The concrete must be C6. And he goes into these kind of poetic, beautiful descriptions of concrete and the buildings and how obviously it means so much to him. This is not just a job, it's a vocation. He's deeply, deeply responsible for the structural integrity of the building, this huge building that's going up. And meanwhile, his boss calls him. So he gets fired because he's they're like, where are you? Are you kidding me? And he tells them, he tells them why he's not going to be able to be there. He gets fired, even though he's worked for them for nine years. He's never set a foot wrong, but they can't, you know, the word comes from on high. So he's gets fired from his high paying job. He comes clean to his wife who freaks out, can't at all see, um, you know, he's, he's between these two women, his wife and the, and the mother of this new child and his wife just totally, I mean, understandably, I suppose, but she can't see that Yes, this is a horrible thing that he betrayed her and cheated on her, but like this, you know, there's like a new baby about to come into the world and that he's being responsible for it. Like she, t that completely passes her by. She's just utterly pissed off and hurt and tells him like he's dirty. She doesn't want him. He, has a, he doesn't have a home in there anymore. And meanwhile, his boys are calling him and they're like, dad, dad, where are you? Mom made sausages and, um, so it's, you know, he's got a million different things um, going on. And, and the mother is also calling him from the hospital. And she's kind of whiny and needy and clingy. And um, she wants to get him to say that he loves her. And he won't lie. This is such as his integrity. And she says, do you love me? And he says, I no, how we don't even know each other. She's like, D well, do you hate me? Do you hate me for having the kid? No, I don't hate you. I don't, we don't know each other enough to hate or love each other, but I, can't, but I am going to be there. I am coming to the hospital and I'm going to be there. If it is at all within my power, everything's going to be all right. So he's got this, he's got this great, um, he doesn't, he never freaks out. I mean, he's obviously under incredible, incredible stress and every time he's on in the middle of some huge conversation the you know the electronic voice comes on saying you have a call waiting um anyway so and and then in the in the course of the movie you you learn that his own father was not able to be there for him at his birth or ever after i think i guess he was a drunk and um and so it's a huge, huge wound. And he has these conversations with his father. So he is determined not to be like his father and to give this kid, whether it's a boy or a girl, they don't know a, a chance in the world. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's very, very moving. I mean, it's kind of a tour de force because it's a, it's kind of a, you know, obviously it's a one man in a way. I mean, there's these great voices and the characters of the people who you come to know coming through the, um, the car, the, you know, phone. Um, but he's a wonderful, wonderful actor. I just thought that his acting was superb. And it's a, so it's really a movie about, um, and then the baby's the cord, the umbilical cord is wrapped around the neck. So you don't know if the kid's going to die. And that the, I mean, I'm just going to, I guess it's a spoiler, although it's not, you know, the plot is not, Anyway, the, at the at the end, the baby's born, and the and the mother calls him from the hospital and says, "Listen," and you hear this baby crying, and everything's gone to hell, 
And at the same time, his kids love him. His kids are like, oh, you're going to come home tonight, dad. And, you know, you somehow get, you somehow sense everything, as he keeps saying, is somehow going to be all right, you know, um, because of his integrity. Uh, and he, you know, goes joyously, uh, more or less. Um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, it's like he's a, there's a lot of, uh, rough language as there is it would be but not it's not gratuitous and um you know a lot of it's kind of very funny um i just you know i really uh, uh yeah a movie about a manhood um he's he is to me being a man yeah he strayed and he and he knows it and he owns it yes absolutely doesn't say oh i only you know, he doesn't ask you to feel sorry for him, he takes responsibility, and he knows there's going to be huge repercussions of stuff that means everything to him. He clearly adores his wife and his kids, deeply committed to his job, but uh, but he does the right thing, uh, or or I should say he takes responsibility for his actions. And so there's all, you know, there's all kinds of questions like that hurts your family what's going to happen to his family if, if his income dries up you know there's but um as with life there's never any definitive there's no roadmap we we try to take responsibility for ourselves and um knowing that it's not like all all sun and all shade it's not all black and all white um but I mean, <laughs> luckily, it would have been super heavy handed if the thing, if the ride took place on Christmas Eve. But in a way, it's kind of, uh, in a in a way, it's kind of a great Christmas story, uh, unwittingly, because there is, you know, it's it's in the night. The birth takes place at the end of it. Um, there's this great scene at the end where his brother, his son, calls him and says. There, there's some football player, or rugby player, or whatever, who they all they all re always refer to as a donkey. You know, he's just a ne'er do well. He's always chokes in the clutch, but he comes through and he's made the winning goal. And the kid describes it so beautifully. And Locke, there are tears in his eyes, <laughs> and he says, "Oh, a miracle!" You know. Uh, anyway, so these are the kind of movies that are. Uh, you know, I call them Catholic without being Catholic with a capital C. Um, anyway, there you go. There's a movie suggestion. And uh, as we make our way through this beautiful these days, as we wait for the um, birth of a child in the church against which the gates of hell will not prevail. <laughs> okay. See you soon.